Of all the mysteries that enshroud the world, few are as tantalizing as the nature of elder dragons. These mighty beasts defy the laws of nature and bring disaster wherever they go. They were as natural catastrophes, unpredictable, random, indifferent. Then, one day, a startling discovery is made. Elder dragons of all kinds periodically head in the same direction. Every few decades, these creatures set out towards the sea and into the unknown. Following their traces, the Hunter's Guild's research commission sends out five naval fleets, one after another, in pursuit of this mysterious behavior. Five fleets, sent out at different times, specialized in different disciplines. But they all find the same place. A lost continent, sitting in that distant dark sea, undisturbed, untamed, unseen. They all disembark their ships and set foot into the new world. Before there was a New World Expedition, before there was a Hunter's Guild, yes, even before there were humans at all, there were Elder Dragons. It is a name given only to the most powerful of creatures that roam the known lands. They may spew fire, command the wind, or even call down lightning. What they all have in common, however, is that they are shrouded in mystery. Very little is known about Elder Dragons. But then, nearly half a century ago, the Hunter's Guild scholars were thrown a figurative bone. They had historically been unable to invest much time into researching Elder Dragons in the first place. If one appeared, protecting civilians and repelling the monster were the main priorities, leaving little time for pondering. But then, Around 40 years ago, a small group of researchers made a landmark discovery. While the appearances of Elder Dragons seem largely random, at regular intervals their movements seem to synchronize. Every hundred years, all kinds of Elder Dragons would be seen heading in the same direction, away from the old continent and out into the sea. More concerningly, while this pattern had initially been a once-in-a-century phenomenon, it had begun to accelerate. First, it happened every hundred years, then every fifty, forty, thirty years, until it recently started happening once every decade. So not only was there some place all Elder Dragons migrated to regularly, these migrations were steadily increasing in frequency. This discovery sent shockwaves across the guild, and before long, a subordinate organization was formed to investigate this specific phenomenon, the Research Commission. Their goal was to uncover the mystery behind the event now known as the Elder Crossing. Some were ecstatic at the prospect of being able to finally research Elder Dragons on a larger scale, while others had more pressing, practical concerns. Many high-ranking hunters and administrators worried that this place the dragons were migrating to might be an Elder Dragon breeding ground, a concern that definitely accelerated the formation of the commission. And so, the scholars and hunters of this new organization waited impatiently for a chance to pursue the dragons. And that chance would come quite soon after. As the predicted time for the next Elder Crossing approached, a Kushala Daora, a mighty wind dragon, was spotted flying in that mysterious direction. Immediately, 
a sizable division of the commission manned ships and followed it into the unknown sea. This brave gaggle of pioneers would later come to be known as the First Fleet. As they traversed the stormy sea, they witnessed a baffling sight. Amidst the dark clouds and torrenting rain, the Kushala Daora was attacked by… something. Some unknown creature tore into the wind dragon, who in response created slashing gales of wind. In this roaring tempest, the first fleet was beset by waves and winds of unnatural force, launching their ship around violently. It could have been the end for them, had they not landed on solid ground. As the clouds cleared and both the Kushala Daora and the unknown creature disappeared without a trace, the first fleet looked upon the greatest discovery in the guild's history. A completely new continent, vast and entirely unexplored. The shores and forests these brave men and women saw were the first vestiges of a wild frontier. The New World. The first fleeters immediately understood that their mission had changed. They would not only research Elder Dragons, but they would explore these new lands as well. Led by the imposing Admiral, they quickly began dismantling their ships, repurposing the materials to build the first settlement on the New World, Astera, Star of the New Frontier. The fleet's crown ship, the Celestial Pursuit, which had been launched onto a cliff by the massive storm, was refurbished into a gathering hub for the hunters that would venture out into the unknown. This first landing yielded the discoveries of two distinct zones. West of Astera lay the ancient forest, a thick jungle landmarked by a massive central tree. To the east lay the vast expanse called the Wildspire Waste, an arid desert nonetheless home to many critters. The fleet began cataloging the area in a frenzy, devouring this cornucopia for explorers and scholars alike. Spires that glow in the night, fields of yellowed grass swaying in the breeze, an endless horizon dipped in the colors of the setting sun. The new world offered them many sights of wonder and awe. Not all discoveries were exclusively new, however. Not long after the first landing, a Rathalos was spotted flying above the ancient forest, and on the shores, herds of Aptonoth were encountered shortly after. It seemed that even in this distant place, familiar faces could be found. One discovery in particular had wide-reaching consequences for the entire operation. Scout flies. It was the First Fleet's commander, the right-hand man of the Admiral, who found these curious green bugs and discovered their usefulness. Scout flies have an exceptional sense of smell, and once they lock onto a scent, they can track it across vast distances and distinguish it even among dozens of other stimuli. Even better, they were quite easy to catch, breed, and train. The commander thus pushed to have these flies domesticated, and, within a short period of time, scout flies became a vital tool in monster tracking and hunting. A few tissue samples were enough to attune them to any target. The first fleet did their best in uncovering the secrets of this new land using what they had available, but some challenges proved insurmountable at the time all the same. Notably, Access to the northern side of the continent was completely blocked off by a massive mountain range called the Great Ravine, too steep to climb and too wide to circumvent. There also were mysterious gold fragments that would sometimes be found on the continent, unnaturally pure and oddly shaped. It was believed to be the residues left behind by a new kind of elder dragon, tentatively named Kulf Taroth. While some sightings would allegedly occur, research on it went nowhere. Both of these problems had to be put on hold at the time, as the First Fleet was simply not equipped to solve them yet. But that would change soon. 
Ten years after First Fleet had arrived in the New World, the Elder Crossing occurred again, and again, the Commission sent out a ship to pursue one of the Elder Dragons. This second fleet was tracking a Teostra, and was mostly composed of technicians and blacksmiths, the exact type of reinforcements the New World needed. Disaster almost struck. The second fleet was attacked midway by a dark, thorned monster none of them had ever seen before. They only survived by the skin of their teeth. After reuniting with the first fleet, the engineers of the second got to work on modernizing and upgrading Astera, as well as furthering their understanding of how to utilize the materials of local monsters. The Admiral of the Commission, however, seemed deeply worried about that thorn creature that had attacked the fleet. Shortly after, the Admiral would develop a habit of storming off into the wilderness, shouting that he had seen the creature and would find it for sure this time. During these episodes, the Admiral would go missing for weeks at a time. Not that his subordinates would ever worry about him, since he was said to be as strong as a Rajang. While the second fleet narrowly avoided disaster, the next fleet of the Commission would not be so lucky. Ten years after the second fleet had arrived, a third fleet was dispatched, hot on the tracks of yet another Kushala Daora. This fleet was composed primarily of Wyvarian representatives. These longevious people dedicate their lives to research like few others, and their presence was expected to further aid the New World explorers. As they arrived in Astera, spirits were high, but unfortunately, the Wyvarians' zeal for research would be their downfall. Upon hearing about the mountain range that was blocking off access to the rest of the continent, the Third Fleet flew into a studious frenzy, obsessed with overcoming that very obstacle. In a remarkable feat of engineering, they rapidly converted their main ship into an airship, aiming to simply fly over the Great Ravine and establish a base on the other side. Unfortunately, the skies above the New World are also the territory of powerful flying wyvern, and one of them decided to assert its dominance over these intruders. The Third Fleet airship crashed in the mountains almost immediately, and was considered missing for many years to come. While the Third Fleet's fate was considered a serious setback, the Commission would reach a new milestone with the dispatch of the Fourth Fleet ten years later. Following the traces of a Kirin participating in the Elder Crossing, this fourth group of travelers was mostly composed of merchants and workers, people who'd be able to further develop and maintain Astera. So, upon their safe arrival in Astera, they immediately began crafting sea charts and establishing trade networks. This led to the first ever large-scale return voyage to the Old World from the New Continent. While communication with the Old World had been somewhat possible in limited fashion before, this was the first time a substantial return effort was launched, and successfully at that. The returning fleet consisted mostly of First and Second Fleet members, who had at this point been in the New World for several decades and yearned to return home. As ships began traveling between the continents more frequently, the general public was enthralled by the tales of wonder and adventure coming out from the New World. This, coupled with the fact that venturing into the New World was no longer a one-way trip thanks to the new travel network, led to a massive increase in sign-ups to the Research Commission and the Hunters Guild in general. And so, when the time came for yet another Elder Crossing, the newly assembled Fifth Fleet was the largest yet. While previous fleets had counted between 30 and 200 members, the Fifth Fleet consisted of 500 members, distributed across six ships. And because Astera was now up and running, 
The fifth fleet did not include technicians or merchants or handymen. It was made up of elite hunters, A-listers, who had proven themselves invaluable to the guild. They were to bolster the hunting prowess of Astera and help push further into the continent in hopes of uncovering the secret of the Elder Crossing. The fifth fleet was also the launch of the Research Commission's new System of Two, wherein each elite hunter was paired with their own bespoke handler to manage their paperwork, a system devised to ease the workload of Astera quest maidens. And so, the fifth fleet assembled, ready to follow the path of an enormous elder dragon, Zora Magdaros, a gargantuan beast with a mountain of fire on its back. It often traveled under the water's surface, but the highly skilled Fifth Fleet was certain that they would be able to follow it into the New World. A creature this large would be hard to lose once it reached land, so the Commission aimed to use it to locate the actual end destination of the Elder Crossing. Or at least, that was the plan. Riding the currents that led to the New World, the Fifth Fleet was well on its way. On board, the various pairs of hunters and handlers spent their time getting to know each other. They would rely on one another in the wilderness, so familiarity was key. Among them was a pair that would rise to fame and glory for their contributions to the cause. A young star hunter and their energetic handler. They hadn't even gotten past introductions, however, when their ship was hoisted high above the clouds as if plucked by an unseen force. A mass of rock and magma had suddenly sprung up underneath them like a spring flower, ripping the fleet asunder and scattering its passengers into the sea and onto its rocky platforms. Dazed but undeterred, the young star and their handler scaled the rock mass and, to equal parts delight and shock, realized that it had not been a volcano or mountain at all. What had risen up from underneath them was none other than Zora Magdaros, the very elder dragon they were tracking. There was no time to study the beast though. Hooking onto a wing drake, the duo glided past the dragon, eventually losing sight of it. In its stead, they were greeted by the land they had dreamed of. Under and before them stretched out a vast forest, Aptonoth grazing in the open. The new world. They had made it. The pair managed to crash land in the ancient forest, where the traces of Zora's presence had already begun to warp the landscape. Having lost their weapons in the chaos, the young star and the handler had to sneak around the area, evading the packs of fanged wyvern that roamed the forest. Just as things seemed to be getting dicey, a man wielding a greatsword came to rescue them. This was the field team leader, a chief operative within Astera, who had been dispatched to find the scattered fifth fleeters. With his help, the young star finally made it to Astera's gates, laying eyes onto the New World's crown settlement at last. Astera was a miracle of engineering. Utilizing every resource available to its fullest potential, the explorers of the Research Commission had carved out an existence out here in the deep unknown. Water wheels were used to harness the energy produced by the many local waterfalls, powering much of the infrastructure needed to maintain operations. Every building, housing, administrative, functional, was constructed from parts repurposed from the ships that the various fleets had arrived on. A small cove of plant samples sat in the main yard, where ecologists were trying to harness the immense vitality of the ancient forest to rapidly grow various resources. In just 40 years, Astera had become a jewel out in the new world. As soon as they had arrived, the pair was called in for a meeting with the town council. 
Here, the commander, now an experienced older man, assigned them to investigate the ancient forest. Zora Magdaros had likely left traces behind, and its presence had riled up the local monsters into a frenzy. The mission then was to both find these tracks and cull any problematic monsters that hindered the commission. After gearing up, the young star and the field team leader ventured into the forest, where the fauna was indeed in a frenzy. A group of Kestodon, her berverous brute wyvern endemic to the New World, had become aggressive and territorial near the gate to Astera. Naturally, they needed dealing with. The resulting commotion attracted another agitated inhabitant of the forest, the Great Jagras, Alpha of the Jagras pack, capable of swallowing its prey whole. As the group dealt with this disturbance and pushed deeper into the forest, they found what they had been looking for. A fragment of Zora Magdaros shell, launched off of the beast's back during one of its magma eruptions. This massive slab had lodged itself into the ground here in the forest, just waiting to be studied. However, the group also discovered that the area the slab fell into was the territory of a Puke Puke, a colorful bird wyvern native to the New World. It was considered highly venomous and quite territorial, and so, the field team leader wisely ordered a tactical retreat. More resources and a stronger foothold in the region would be necessary to hunt this monster. In cooperation with Astera's resource management division, the hunter and the field team leader decided to scout out the underbelly of the forest to establish a secondary campsite. The base camp in the forest had so far been adequate, but a second camp in the region would help with supply and territory control. And so, the group ventured back into the forest to secure the designated camp area. Unfortunately, that location already had an inhabitant. A Kulu Yaku, a skittish bird wyvern known to cause trouble. Luckily, this wyvern was not particularly powerful, and the team easily chased it off. As preparations for the secondary camp began, many involved hunters, including the field team leader, grew quite anxious. The arrival of the 5th fleet had rapidly increased the amount of hunters out in the field, as well as the amount of hunting activity in the ancient forest specifically. In that time, the monsters that had been encountered and hunted were predominantly low-threat creatures, such as the Jagras and the Kuliyaku. But throughout all of that, the existence of another species native to the ancient forest had been confirmed from afar. The commission called it Anjanath, a massive brute wyvern that stomped through the forest, marking its territory with snot and dung. Despite its ferocious appearance, it had so far only observed hunters from afar, very rarely venturing near the town gates while chasing some prey. But the hunters of Astera could feel it in their bones. It was only a matter of time before the Anjanath decided that they were intruders in its realm. And they weren't sure if they'd be ready for that. Once the camp was established, a proper hunt for the prowling Puke Puke was finally organized. It could spew poison from both its maw and its tail, but in the end, the young star prevailed, striking the killing blow themselves. Free from the threat of the Puke, the Zora slab could finally be analyzed properly. What was immediately noted was the strange behavior that the hunter's scout flies displayed when near the slab. Their characteristic green glow gave way to a deep blue, which had not been observed before. Moreover, the slab seemed to brim with some kind of energy, as the air around it felt tense and thick. While researchers toiled to recover and investigate the slab, the young star was called into another meeting with the commander. Here, 
the old man announced a full-scale investigation into Zora Magdaros, the first phase of which consisted of finding as many of these slabs as possible. One such rock had been sighted in the Wildspire Waste, and so, the young star and their handler were tasked with escorting a group of scholars to that slab and haul it back to Astera. Heading out the eastern gate of Astera, this small group entered the Wildspire Waste, an arid desert broken up by a small forest in the west and a bog in the southeast. The flat, sun-baked landscape was dominated by the towering wildspires, enormous anthills built by a local species of carrier ants. It was at the foot of one of these wildspires that the Zora slab had been sighted. The slab recovery team hauled their cart across the rock and sand without too much trouble, save for one close encounter with a curious Rathian. Before long, they had reached the slab, and once again, the hunter's scout flies erupted in that eerie blue glow. But just as the scholars had begun eagerly loading the slab onto their cart, a familiar face crashed this moment of discovery. A Baroth, an armed brute wyvern well known to any hunter worth their salt. Its shell could deflect blades as easily as it could crush bones. Moving quickly, the young star was able to lure the monster away, giving the scholars time to retrieve the slab. Fighting relentlessly, the young star was able to slay the Baroth, breaking through its hide and securing victory. Exhausted from the fight, the star was just about ready to head home, when a mysterious stranger approached them. This was a hooded wyvarian, and, judging by the insect glaive he wielded, a hunter as well. Wyvarian hunters were extremely rare. Their kind usually preferred science and research. This stranger invited the star to rest up at a nearby camp, share a drink, and exchange stories. The star gratefully accepted, and spent a few hours chatting with this mysterious man. He was wise in many things, and seemed particularly interested in finding the truth of the new world. As the cups ran dry, the Wyvarian excused himself, promising that the star would meet him again before disappearing again into the wilderness. Once the star reconvened with their handler and returned to Astera, their descriptions of the meeting were met with wide-eyed wonder. The person the star had shared drinks with was known as the Seeker, a legendary Wyvarian hunter that had been part of the First Fleet. Shortly after arriving in the New World, however, the Seeker had packed his belongings and dashed into the wild, saying that he needed to investigate that which lies beyond. He had been officially considered missing ever since. The Star was likely the first person to see him in ages. As the slab from the Wildspire Waste arrived safely in Astera, the Commission's research into Zora Magdoros progressed quickly. Scholars managed to indeed confirm the presence of some kind of special energy within the beast's shell, but could not yet determine what it actually was. Progress was stifled when the Commission realized that one scientist had gone missing. They had last been seen in the Wildspire Waste. The young star was immediately assigned to mount a search operation, and so, returned to the wasteland at once. As soon as they had stepped foot into the waste, the star felt that something was off. No major red flags at first. The air was just too quiet, too still, too tense. Then, a few more dead animals than one would expect. Revultures flying around slightly too gleefully. It was all just a tad off. Nevertheless, the young star pushed further into the waste and soon began finding traces of the lost scholar. The tracks led into the boglands of the area, where the young star was greeted by a bizarre sight. The scholar, trembling and weeping in fear, sitting on a rock in the swamp. Next to him, the corpse of a Baroth, seemingly impaled to death, 
by long black thorns, still embedded in its dead skin. The scholars seemed shell-shocked and were only stammer as the young star approached and recovered him. He seemed equally terrified and mesmerized by the dead Baroth. But before the young star could investigate, the marsh around them came alive with bubbling ferocity and the corpse was pulled under. The assailant was a Juratodos, an ancient Piscean wyvern that had been attracted by the stench of the corpse. It then set its sights on the young star, another snack helplessly stuck in the mire. A fatal mistake on the Juratodos' part, for the young star was a capable hunter and fended off the territorial fish admirably. The news of this incident spread unease across Astera. While everyone was glad that the scholar had made it back safe and sound, the description of the black thorns stuck in the Baroth were quite unsettling to many. It reminded them of the black thorned monster that had assaulted the second fleet. That uneasiness would however soon turn into bewildered excitement as the commander called in a council meeting that day to discuss a truly outrageous plan. Finding and studying the slabs had awakened an urgency in him, and he now proposed that in order to truly unravel the mystery of the Elder Crossing, the commission would have to pull off the feet of the century, capturing Zora Magdaros in order to study it up close. Capturing Elder Dragons had long been considered absolutely impossible, and so this suggestion was met with confusion. The commander elaborated. The Zora Magdaros tracks they had found, as well as a general study of the land, had led the research team to believe that the dragon would soon appear near the Great Ravine as part of its mysterious journey. The high rocky walls of the mountain range dwarfed even the enormous Zora Magdaros, forcing it into a narrow corridor. And that is where the commission would make its move. By building a pair of barriers and lining them, as well as the rock walls, with cannons and ballistae, the hunters would be tasked with exhausting the trapped creature until it was tired enough to be ensnared. With a body that size, Zora Magdaros would likely need some time to recover its strength enough to move once it was exhausted. In that time, the scholars would descend onto the creature and study as if their lives depended on it. They would take tissue samples, analyze and sketch the dragon's teeth, and most crucially, target train a flock of scout flies to be specifically attuned to the scent of Zora Magdaros. This would allow for more sophisticated tracking of the species in the future. Once these goals would be achieved, the dragon would be freed again and left in peace, with the gathered data forming the bedrock for further studies. This was a daring plan, to say the least, and one that would require every bit of fire and manpower that Astera had. But the New World Explorers were pioneers after all. Doing the unprecedented was just their daily bread. Hunters, provisioners, researchers, everyone got to work, fired up by this insane stratagem. Many preparations had to be completed before the plan could be executed, however. Most crucially, Astera would have to be secured. Nearly all hunters of Astera would have to participate for this plan to work, meaning that the town itself would be left basically defenseless during that time. To ensure the commission even had a home to return to after the mission, the area around Astera would have to be sweeped, driving off or slaying any monsters that could cause havoc in their absence. As part of that, the Anjanath that prowled the ancient forest near Astera would have to be dealt with. It had so far mostly kept its distance, but it was only a matter of time until it decided to venture closer. Should the Brute Wyvern approach Astera while all the hunters were gone, it would be a disaster. And so, the young star and their handler were put in charge of taking down the Anjanath preemptively. Brute wyverns were considered highly dangerous, and the Anjanath looked to be a fierce opponent. 
Before the star could set out on this daunting task, they were pulled aside by the chief botanist, who had a proposition. He had been considering creating a specialized tool to help hunters in their efforts. A ghillie mantle, covered in material that mimicked local flora and allowed the wearer to blend into the environment. Perfect for observations and sneak attacks. He figured that this invention would greatly aid the star in their fight against the Anginath. Unfortunately, the plants needed to build that camouflaging outer layer of the mantle grew in only a specific cove in the ancient forest. And that spot had recently been claimed by a wild monster, a Tobi Kadachi. So the young star agreed to drive off the creature and, in exchange, received the first ghillie mantle the botanist could manufacture. Armed with the ghillie mantle and energized from the fight against the Tobi Kadachi, it was now time for the star to set out and defeat the tyrant of the forest. It was a grueling fight. The Anjanath's fire breath could have incinerated the young star in an instant. But through clever use of the ghillie mantle and old-fashioned grit and determination, the brute wyvern was ultimately slain successfully. The time had come. The preparations had been made and the ambush in the great ravine was set up. The hunters assembled in the dark of night, each team assigned to a small crevice in the rocky walls where they lay in wait next to the cannons and ballistae that would be their lifeline. The ecology team predicted that Zora Magdaros would surface at this location when the sun dawned. It was an uneasy night, as everyone fiddled with their gear. The scale of this operation was unlike anything any of them had participated in. Nearly every resource available to the New World crew pointed at one singular goal. They had to succeed. As sunrise approached, the scout flies grew restless. Finally, they erupted into the open air, their glow synchronizing into that familiar mystery blue. For a moment, they lay suspended in midair. Then, the rumbling began, scattering the flies and splitting the earth. In unison, both the sun and the dragon rose, the crumbling ground of the ravine being torn asunder in the wake of the emerging Zora Magdaros. As the massive shadow engulfed the narrow valley, the capture operation officially began. The air was heavy with smoke and dense with the sounds of cannon fire. At the back of the rocky corridor, Two barricades had been erected that were pelting the dragon with salvos non-stop. The young star was here too, naturally, helping out with the cannon squad. The first phase of the engagement was to tire the beast out by bombarding it continuously, slowing its advance in the process. As it moved closer to the first barrier, the stationed hunters evacuated their positions and left the barrier. It had served its purpose. With a roar, Zora Magdaros crashed into that first barrier, breaking through it with seeming ease. But the plan was working. The constant bombardments, as well as the strain of breaking that barrier, had slowed it down notably. It was time for phase two. As the dragon's advance crawled to a leisurely stroll, it was now going slow enough for winged rakes to safely hover near it. The young star's team thus used their flying transports to hop onto Zora Magdaros' back. Their objective? Find and injure the creature's magma cores, superficial structures that should, once destroyed, weaken the dragon enough to allow for capture. Climbing around the Zora's shell was a struggle, but the hunters pushed through the hardship and eventually managed to destroy most of the magma cores they could find. At this point, Zora Magdaros had become visibly tired. That was the signal for the Binder Squad, which launched trapper harpoons into the creature's hide. With a thundering screech, the dragon pulled against the ropes that ensnared it, but its exhaustion had now set in fully. A few more minutes of bombardment, a few more destroyed magma cores, and the operation would be complete. And that 
was when everything fell apart. A scout was the first to report it. Another monster had appeared on top of Zora Magdaro's shell. In a panic, the hunters scattered across the shell, scrambled to investigate. As the young star reached the rocky plateau the creature had been sighted on, they recognized it, despite never having seen it before. A dark body littered with thorns and spikes, a brutal appearance for a brutal monster. This was the dragon that had attacked the second fleet all those years ago, and had more recently wreaked havoc in the Wildspire Waste. What in the world was it doing here, at this crucial moment? It immediately began interfering with the operation. It lashed at hunters, trying to crash into them with its heavy body. In the ensuing chaos, it also dislodged some of the binder harpoons. This thing had to be dealt with, and quickly. The young star did their best to fend it off, but the creature was fast and powerful, too much so to be easily repelled. In this moment of desperation, the huntsman rushed in to help. A member of the original First Fleet, this old warrior was considered one of the strongest hunters currently stationed in the New World. Wordlessly, he engaged the black creature and stood his ground formidably, even severing some of its thorns. But to everyone's shock and surprise, the thorn simply regrew almost instantly. The battle grew ever fiercer, and just as the huntsman was ready to clash with the interloper again, Zora Magdaros began to stir. The commission's attention had been divided by the intruder, and so, the easing of the bombardment and the loss of some of the binders had given the massive Elder Dragon a moment to catch its breath. It resumed its movements, it broke free of the restraints, it roared in anger and relief, and then broke through the second barrier. The thorn creature took to the air and vanished into the sky. As the hunters watched Zora Magdaros push further into the Great Ravine and past all of their defenses, the realization began to set in. The operation had been a complete and utter failure. The days following this disaster were some of Estera's lowest. Not only had the provisions of the town been nearly entirely exhausted for a failed cause, but the spirits of the residents were at an all-time low. Well, most of them, anyway. The commander seemed entirely undeterred by his plan's failure, and had immediately begun thinking of a way forward. He assigned the captain, an old seafarer, to hurry his ship back to the old world to both inform and request aid from the guild headquarters. In the meantime, the commander decreed that their mission had not changed. They would continue investigating Zora Magdaros. In his plan's failure, this man saw an opportunity. The dragon may have escaped, but in doing so, its massive body had carved out a sizable crack in the Great Ravine. This meant that, for the first time, the Commission would be able to expand the explored territory and venture north. But Astera was depleted, and most workers and hunters were busy just resupplying. So, the commander tasked the young star and their handler to follow Zora Magdaros' path, and explore what lies past that massive stone wall. Setting out into the Great Ravine, the pair looked up at the enormous structure. All that rock, and Zora Magdaros had simply broken through it. They followed the dragon's path in silence, until they found what they were looking for. A rupture in the wall that was deep and wide enough to walk through. With bated breath, they walked through and emerged from the shadowy stone tunnel into a landscape of pure fantasy. The Great Ravine was not really a wall, as much as it was a giant bowl, its craggy peaks forming a massive circular barrier, inside of which the pair now stood. And in this circle lay an utterly bizarre sight. Massive, colorful land corals, growing from the bottom of the ravine in such numbers and sizes 
that said bottom and the roots were entirely obscured from vision. The corals formed various platforms, cliffs, caves, and every other structure one would expect from a landscape. Cloud layers hung around the crowns of the tallest corals, while massive, bug-like creatures floated among them. The air was full of tiny pink particles and had a sweet smell to it. It was like stepping into a dream. However, before the young star could even begin to imagine the hows and the whys behind this wonderland, their instincts began screaming at them. Mesmerized by the corals, they had failed to notice that something was headed right for them. Before there was any time to react, a large flying wyvern appeared before them, teeth gnashing and wings flapping. The sheer force of its wing strikes broke apart the coral beneath the pair's feet, and they plummeted helplessly to the bottom of the ravine. That is where their story should have ended. But instead, the young star and the handler awoke shortly after, laying on wood and draped in blankets. Through the haze of their waking consciousness, the young star observed yet another bizarre sight. A large, decorated hall, adorned with banners and filled with staircases. On various levels, desks and chairs formed small islands of research. And at the highest level, a vivarian woman laid sprawled out, clearly in charge of the entire thing. Once the pair had sufficiently awoken, the woman gestured them over to her. Even before she spoke a single word, the young star finally recognized where they were. The symbol on the banners was unmistakable. This was the crown ship of the Third Fleet, the group of researchers that had gone missing 20 years prior while attempting to fly over the Great Ravine. The woman, who introduced herself as the Third Fleet Master, confirmed this realization. They had survived their crash landing and had made the most out of their precarious situation. Their airship had been permanently damaged, and so they simply remained here, studying the outside carefully. The Third Fleet had no hunters, and so they could only venture into the wild in a very limited fashion. There was one exception, another hunter who had discovered the stranded Third Fleet sometime earlier, and had functioned as both their means of communication and a supplier of materials and data. This hunter, called the Tracker, had been the one to find the young star and their handler after they had fallen to the bottom of the ravine, their fall cushioned by the various corals. The third fleet master also explained the wondrous sights found in the Great Ravine. This great rock circle contained two layers. The upper level was known as the Coral Highlands, a massive formation of platforms and elevations created by the enormous land corals. It was an area abundant with life. The lower level, sitting right underneath this cornucopia, was known as the Rotten Vale, a corpse heap where dead monsters fall to be decomposed by airborne bacteria. In the coming days, communication and contact between the Third Fleet base and Astera was fully re-established and expanded. Thanks to Zora Magdaros, accessing the lost ship was easier than ever. After careful comparison of research notes involving a visit from the field team leader, it was decided that getting to the bottom of the Rotten Vale should be a priority for the Commission. The interplay between the Vale and the Highlands seemed to have a vast influence on the ecosystem of the New World, and where ecosystems behave unusually, Elder Dragons are generally not far off. Additionally, the predicted trajectory of Zora Magdaros would indeed lead it right through the Rotten Vale. But in order to descend further into the Vale, the Third Fleet's airship would have to be repaired. It was, after all, the most powerful mobile vessel the Commission currently had access to. In order to fix the damage, the engineers requested Paolumu hides from the Young Star. This would be their first proper hunt in the Coral Highlands, as Paolumu exclusively live among the corals. And so, the Young Star set out into the Coral Highlands. Between the coral forests and dank sea stone caves, 
the young star witnessed many wondrous sights. Clearings of pure color, little ponds where Kelby prance while hummingbirds dance around the coral trees. Further in, coral caves gave refuge to slithering fanged wyvern, competing with an odd bird wyvern that used the head crest to blind its enemies. The young star had to actively try not to get distracted by this land of wonder, and so they reached their destination undeterred. A large coral tree, where the Paolumu had been sighted. The skin that made up this wyvern's inflatable neck sack would be ideal for refurbishing the airship and getting it ready. Thus, in this land of color and serenity, the young star battled the Paolumu, claiming victory as they always did. Once the materials were gathered and the airship repaired, it was time to descend into the veil. First, the young star and their handler would be lowered into the upper zone of the veil via pulley to scout out a good landing spot for the ship. The third fleet did not want to crash again, after all. Descending into the veil was, much like with the Coral Highlands, like entering a different world. Just this time, it was not that of a dream, but of a nightmare. The colorful corals gave way to dark gray rocks and coral skeletons, submerged in a thick, yellowed fog. As the pair's pulley took them ever further into the depths, a grotesque sight eventually revealed itself. A giant skeleton, the remains of an enormous dragon, merged into a mass of rock and smaller bones. Every surface was covered in death and decay, corpses piling up until they too became solid ground. Eventually, the pulley reached a clearing that looked perfect for the airship to land on. A small gaggle of cobra-like fanged wyvern was slinking around there though, so the young star quickly jumped off to dispatch them. That ended up being quite easy. A single torch pod launched from the hunter's slinger scattered the pack in all directions, while also curiously dispelling the yellow fog around the flame. It seemed that the residents of the Vale feared fire. Securing the landing zone was quick work. A rolling brute wyvern, similar to the Uragan known in the Old World, was sighted shortly after the pair had landed leading the young star to chase it down to ensure it wouldn't cause any trouble. This massive creature, later named Radoban, had an oily skin that it stuck bones to as armor, making it a formidable opponent. But unfortunately for it, the young star was themselves a force to be reckoned with, and the Radoban was dealt with quickly. As the two were making the last preparations, they were reunited with the person that had saved their life, the Tracker. After finally exchanging greetings and gratitudes, the Handler shared the team's findings on Zora Magdaros with the Tracker. She then promised to scour the Vale for any clues and, upon their next meeting, reveal the true nature of this place to the pair. Until then, the tracker encouraged them to think carefully about what the Rotten Vale and the Coral Highlands represent. Now that the landing zone had been cleared and the airship was repaired, it was time to take to the skies. Among the clouds, the beauty of the Coral Highlands became all the more apparent. But before the vessel could begin its descent into the Vale properly, a new complication arose. The skies were the territory of the Legiana, the apex predator of the Coral Highlands and the same monster that had crashed the Third Fleet 20 years ago. And just as before, a Legiana spotted the vessel and immediately became aggressive. Flying the airship while this wyvern was active was extremely dangerous, and so the mission was aborted. Instead, the young star was sent out to vanquish the Legiana to allow for safe air travel at last. It would be no easy task. The Legiana were known to make their nests at the highest peaks of the highlands, not easily accessible by mere humans. But the shooting star of the Fifth Fleet rose to the task, as they always did, and successfully freed the skies from the terror of the Legiana. And now, 
Finally, the airship could properly descend into the veil. Danger still lingered. The further down one went into the veil, the thicker the yellow fog became. This fog was actually an amalgamation of various kinds of airborne bacteria, which multiplied here en masse to feed on the ample supply of cadavers. These gaseous clusters of decompositional bacteria were collectively called effluvium. While not immediately harmful to humans, they could cause serious damage to the body through long-term exposure. Undeterred, the shooting star ventured into the depths of the veil through the thickest of effluvium. Aided by the tracker, the team pushed into the bowels of the area where, finally, they found another slab from Zora Magdro's shell, confirming that it had indeed passed through the area. As always, the air around it hummed with that strange energy. Before the team could do more than gawk, however, their discovery was interrupted by a truly fearsome foe, an Odogaran, the apex predator of the Lower Vale and a fierce fanged wyvern. The tracker tried to fend it off for a bit, but ultimately, this was yet another task for the young star themselves. The strikes of the Odogaran were lightning fast, as the beast leapt from wall to wall, its serrated claws out for blood. But there was simply no stopping the shooting star's journey. Before long, the Odogaran lay defeated, and the star stood tall. As they reunited with the tracker, she reminded them of their last meeting and asked the question. Had they learned of the true nature of this area? Caught up in the fighting and the running, neither the star nor the handler had given it much thought. And yet, when the question was posed, the answer simply came to them, as if plucked out of thin, bacteria-laden air. The rotten veil is where monsters come to die. Satisfied, the tracker nodded and took them on a stroll up into the highlands, while she informed them of what she had learned in her long time here. The Rotten Veil was, simply put, both the heart and the stomach of the New World. Monsters from all over the place journey here when they feel that the end is near, a final pilgrimage before departing this world. Once they die, their bodies fell into the veil where they were decomposed. The nutrients this process yielded then nourished the growth of the corals, leading to the extreme abundance of flora and fauna in the highlands. They sat right above the central energy factory of the continent. Death and life locked into a cycle that maintains both. But the Rotten Veil vale did not merely maintain the coral highlands. All life on the continent was, in one way or another, influenced by the nutrients produced by this area's decomposition cycle. And there was only one kind of creature whose body could release enough energy to feed an ecosystem of this scale sustainably. Elder Dragons. The Elder Crossing was a funeral procession, as aging Elder Dragons were drawn towards the Rotten Vale in their final days. Then, when a dragon reached the veil and died, its nutrients would flood the new world like a tidal wave of life, renewing the entire continent and enabling this massive ecosystem to continue to thrive. The five fleets, the commission, the adventures, the chase, the mystery of Zora Magdaros, the elder crossing, the bizarre structures of the new world, the massive ancient trees, the wild spires, it all culminated in this hypothesis, the New World's Rotten Vale was the final resting place of Elder Dragons, and where their abundant life force was recycled. It was a daring, magical idea, but one that seemed almost inevitably true to those who had seen the wonders of the New World. As the tracker pointed out, however, three mysteries still remained. Why had the Elder Crossing increased in frequency? And if the goal of crossing Elder Dragons was to die in the Veil, vale, where was Zora Magdaros now? And lastly, what was so special about the New World? Death happened everywhere, 
But how did this continent specifically manage to redistribute nutrients and life so effectively? Neither the tracker nor the pair could come up with an answer. The tracker did however know of someone who might be able to solve these mysteries as well. The first Wyvarians. They were an elusive tribe native to the New World and had only interacted with the Commission a scant few times. They also had a reputation of being wise and knowledgeable about the continent they called home. If anyone could illuminate the mysteries of this land, it was them. The pair returned to Astera and shared their findings with the commander. Eagerly, he decided to increase activity in the Rotten Vale and began sending more hunters and researchers into those depths to investigate. As for the first Wyvarians, the shooting star was in luck. The commander had recently received a report describing a first Wyvarian sighting in the ancient forest. And so, the shooting star and their handler climbed into the high crowns of the ancient forest, where the first Wyvarian had been spotted. Up high above the forest floor, the sheer size and girth of the ancient tree was truly breathtaking. What equally halted the pair's breath was the sight of a Rathalos, circling in the air above them and swooping down in territorial zeal. They were in the king's territory, and fighting him would have been neither wise nor necessary at this time. Tumbling through the vines and branches, the pair managed to escape the wyvern's wrath, landing in a shaded clearing. A moment later, cautious awareness turned into elation. As if guided by fate, they had landed right next to the first wyvarian they sought. An air of wisdom surrounded this native of the new world. His face was obscured by the tribe's signature net masks and yet he exuded calm, dispassionate knowledge. He spoke in short sentences, neither amicable nor hostile. The first Wyvarian confirmed that he and his people did indeed have deeper knowledge about the New World, and also that they knew more about Zora Magdaros. However, there always seemed to be a however, the tribe would not share this knowledge with just anyone. To lay bare the secrets of their homeland would be an act of immense trust, and they would only extend that trust to a true master of nature. Concretely, the first Wyvarian was asking the shooting star to prove their worth by defeating two kings. Diablos, Lord of the Sand, and Rathalos, King of the Skies. Both in the Old World and the New, these two were considered apexes of the highest caliber. Besting them would thus place the hunter as the undisputed champion of the ecosystem. Most hunters would have wept in despair at this task. Both of these monsters were infamous for their ferocity, after all. But the Fifth Fleet's shooting star had already scaled so many obstacles, faced challenges of all kinds. This would be difficult but not impossible. Nothing ever was in the new world. And so, the star rose to the task. In the crowns of the ancient forest, they battled the Rathalos, maw aflame and talons envenomated. In the depths of the Wildspire Waste, they faced the Diablos, its twin horns aiming for the kill. And both of these fights ended the same way the enemy slain, the star towering over them victoriously. The pair returned to the first Wyvarian, who was satisfied with the star's performance. They had proven themselves to be fierce and strong, and had earned the right to know the truth. Throughout their existence on this plane, all living things accumulate various essential substances, nutrients, minerals, energy reserves, a living body is a stockpile of life-giving essences. But most importantly, the first Vivarian stressed, living creatures produce and hold a substance called bioenergy. It exists in anything that lives and is derived from those essential substances the body holds. When a living being dies, 
their nutrients, their minerals, their bioenergy, simply leaks out around them, turning their body into fertilizer for their immediate surroundings. But that was where the new world was different. Deep underground, this continent had a massive system of underground tunnels that spread throughout the entire new world. These underground rivers, called the Everstream, had the bizarre ability to absorb, store, and transport bioenergy itself, like veins pumping blood. And one of its major entrances was right below the Rotten Vale. So, when a monster died in the Rotten Vale, its bioenergy would not just float upwards and nourish the Coral Highlands, but also partially seep down into the Everstream, where it would then be redistributed across the entire continent. That was how the Rotten Vale could fuel the New World, and how dying Elder Dragons could send their enormous reserves of bioenergy across the vast continent upon dying. In their final days, the Elder Dragons sensed the vast amount of energy coursing through the Everstream and chase it down, their strength usually expiring either in or near the Rotten Vale. This signal draws in Elder Dragons regularly and ensures the continued prosperity of the New World's ecosystem. The first Wyvarians had been overseeing this process for generations, and they too were confused by the increased frequency of arrivals. They had observed Zora Magdaros as it entered the Rotten Vale, and had watched it push further into the Earth and directly into the Everstream. Unlike all other Elder Dragons, Zora had actually entered the Everstream itself and was attempting to travel through it, for reasons unknown even to the first Wyvarians. The wise native ended his lecture with a dire warning. A creature as large as Zora Magdaros held an unthinkable amount of bioenergy. Had it died in the Rotten Vale, it would have drastically impacted the land around it through the sheer amount of released energy. But if it perished while in close or direct contact with the Everstream itself, the resulting explosion of bioenergy could very easily ripple across the entire network and overload it, burning the new world to ash in the process. It would take the entire continent down with it. The pair hurried these dire news to Astera, where the commander immediately convened a council meeting. The commission was facing a very real risk of being exterminated alongside the entire continent. Some suggested a large-scale evacuation using the Third Fleet's airship, while others declared that Zora Magdaros would have to be slain. Neither were effective solutions. The Third Fleet airship would never be able to hold all Astera residents, and killing Zora Magdaros would simply anticipate the detonation. It was the Shooting Star's own handler that suggested a promising strategy. Zora Magdaros cannot be allowed to die in the Everstream, so why not try to simply divert its course? According to research into the matter, the Everstream bordered onto the open sea in the east of the continent, and based on trajectory projections, Zora Magdaros would soon pass through there. If the Commission could push it back with enough force, causing it enough pain, the dragon might decide to instead swim out into the sea and die there, mitigating the impact of the blast. This would have the additional benefit of empowering the oceanic ecosystem or even creating an entirely new one worth studying. The commander was immediately on board with the idea. The only problem would be the supply situation. The failed capture operation had exhausted Astero's resources, so this assault would have to be carried out with much fewer armaments. Luckily, the Argosi captain had recently returned from the Old World, bringing with him a boatload of cannons and ballistae. Not a complete replenishment of Astera's defense force, but a respectable stockpile nonetheless. And most of all, the guild had also sent them a trump card. A dragon ship, an armed vessel equipped with the ultimate anti-elder dragon weapon a Dragonator. The stage was soon set. 
As the commission built a makeshift barricade at the mouth of the Everstream, where they would intercept Zora Magdaros, tension hung heavily in the air once again. This would be the culmination of 40 years of research and hard work, and it all hinged on whether or not they could persuade this walking mountain to change its path. They had just finished rigging the stalactites with explosives when the signal came in. Zora Magdaros had been sighted and was indeed on the predicted route. It was time. As the dragon approached, the hunters of the commission mounted its massive shell once more. Just like last time, the goal was to destroy or damage as many magma cores as possible, causing it as much pain and annoyance as they could. It was like chipping away at a literal mountain, but alas, every broken magma core did result in a small reaction from the dragon, an irritated twitch of sorts. Suddenly, just like last time, a figure appeared above the shell, the same thorny dark dragon that had intercepted the capture operation. While the past few weeks had been illuminating in understanding Zora Magdaros and the Elder Crossing, this bizarre aggressor remained a complete mystery. The only development in its research was that it had been given an official name, Nergigante. Just as it had done before, Nergigante swooped down onto the Zora's shell and began interfering with the mission again, attacking hunters and stopping them from dealing with the magma cores. However, the shooting star was ready this time. They had conquered many fearsome enemies since the last time they had met Nergigante, and their abilities had grown many fold. This time, the shooting star held their own against the thorned interloper, pushing it back and breaking off its regenerating spikes. The creature seemed almost confused. Had it come to mess with the commission's plan again, expecting an easy fight, only to be actually challenged? After a few fierce blows, the Nergigante took off, disappearing once again into the skies. At the same time, Zora Magdaros had almost reached the barricade that was peppering it with cannon fire. Its movements were slow, its head was drooping, it was tired and annoyed, just as the commission wanted it. Now it was time for the coup de grace, the all or nothing gamble. If the creature did not yield, did not relent, then all would be lost. At last, Zora Magdaros entered the range of the Dragonator. With a signal followed by a screeching howl, the lever was pulled and a massive drill spear erupted out of the ship, boring deep into the massive dragon. Dragonators had long since been used by the Hunter's Guild to repel Elder Dragons, but they had never been deployed against such a large creature. The long, rotating blades of the drill looked like mere needles next to the enormous dragon. But Zora Magdaros was a creature with no equal. It had no natural predators, feared no danger. It lived its whole life protected by its size and its shell. So, this moment, the Dragonator screaming into its flesh, might have been the very first time this ancient being had ever felt even an ounce of pain. And oh, how that pain burned! With a shudder, Zora Magdaros recoiled and roared in anguish. It was no mortal wound, but it hurt. It hurt badly. The old dragon moved backwards, first a little, then more. It eyed the barrier for a moment, then the Dragonator. And then, finally, it turned around and swam out into the open sea. Within mere moments, the massive, dying dragon had disappeared beneath the waves. It took another second for it to sink in. For an instant, there was nothing but tense silence. And then joy, cheering and howling, the commission erupted in victorious merriment, throwing themselves into each other's arms. They had done it. They had won. As the Everstream Corridor filled with the sounds of triumph, 
the shooting star and her friends looked upon a job well done, ready to enjoy a well-earned break. But even in this moment of unrestrained joy, a question still lingered. Why did Zora Magdaros attempt to enter the Everstream in the first place? The following days were some of the most hopeful the Commission had ever experienced. Nearly every resident of Astera took their time to relax and bask in their success. The shooting star themselves had become a sensation due to all of their accomplishments. Many now called them the Sapphire Star, a reference to an old legend wherein a star represents a guiding light. They enjoyed the respect and admiration of many hunters, both younger and older. Meanwhile, Astera, no longer burdened with the looming mystery of Zora Magdaros, began to bloom and grow into an even more impressive stronghold. On his last trip, the Argosi captain had charted and established a fast and secure route between the continents. Now, trade and communication with the Old World would be faster and more consistent than ever. Stockpiles grew, the smithy became able to craft more complex gear, and the overall degree of luxury and comfort in the settlement increased rapidly. They had solved the Elder Crossing, and now they got to enjoy peace. Most of them, at least. The Sapphire Star and their handler remained in active duty, exploring the lands and observing monsters day in and day out. While Astera was busy rejoicing, the wilds of the New World stirred with newfound vigor. Monsters had begun behaving in unusually aggressive ways, with some even migrating around the continent to compete in turf wars. These new patterns began posing a serious risk to hunters out in the field, and the commander eventually declared investigating these oddities as the commission's new goal. The Sapphire Star themselves was sent out to observe a Puke Puke that had left the ancient forest and had instead ventured into the Wildspire Waste. Just watching it from afar, it was obvious that this Puke Puke was different from the ones the star had thus far encountered. It looked rougher and more agitated. Immediately upon spotting the star, the Puke began attacking relentlessly, using strategies and behaviors not yet seen in the species. It also seemed much stronger, giving the Sapphire Star a respectable walloping. But more concerningly, the Wildspire Waste was covered in the tracks of an unknown monster. In between teaching this errant Puke a lesson, the Sapphire Star kept finding odd pink scales scattered around the habitat, unlike anything seen in the local fauna. Once the Puke had been captured for research, the Star returned to Astera to report their findings. Worryingly, other hunters had also reported seeing these unknown tracks, seemingly always accompanied by the appearance of powerful monsters. Research into this occurrence intensified over the following days, with hunters finding tracks in all sorts of places. Eventually, it was determined that whatever had left behind those scales had gone into the Coral Highlands. Eagerly, the Sapphire Star and their handler accepted the urgent quest to find and capture this unknown creature. They had barely arrived in the Coral Highlands when the mystery monster made its move. As the star was descending from the Windrake, balls of liquid fire rushed at and passed them. Something had already begun its assault. With some difficulty, the star managed to land in the Highlands, where they gazed upon their attacker. It was none other than a pink Rathian, a subspecies of Rathian that was well known to old world hunters but had so far never been sighted on the new continent. Its enhanced armor and aggressive temper make it a tough opponent even for experienced hunters. But ultimately, the Sapphire Star succeeded at defeating and capturing this specimen. In Astera, the captured Pink Rathian caused loud and disbelieving commotion. Subspecies were considered a rare phenomenon, 
and this was the first time it had ever been observed in the New World. Before anyone could present any convincing theories, however, another startling event occurred. At the west gate of Astera, a hulking man, built like a Rajang, appeared. This was the Admiral, returning from yet another period of lonesome wild adventures. He seemed quite up to date with the events regarding Zora Magdaros. He had been watching everything unfold from afar. With him, he had brought a bag full of mysterious crystals. Without elaborating, he handed them out to the star and their partner. Holding one of them, their significance was immediately obvious. They were anything but dead rock, humming and sizzling with the same tension they had felt around Zora Magdaros' shell. These crystals were full of bioenergy. Bemused at the look on the Sapphire Star's face, the Admiral gestured to them to follow him. He showed them where he had found these stones, and why they mattered. As they returned to the Everstream, where they had pushed Zora Magdaros into the sea, the Admiral showed them a large crack in the passage. When the dragon had attempted to make its way through the Everstream, it had ruptured its walls and torn its borders. The Admiral was leading the star and the handler into one such rupture, a rocky tunnel covered in crystals and pools of magma. As they made their way through this corridor, the Admiral began to explain his findings. For the last 30 years, he had periodically tracked and investigated Nergigante whenever it appeared. This monster, which the Admiral firmly believed to be an Elder Dragon itself, was exceptionally ferocious and violent, attacking creatures of any size and strength without hesitation. But while Nergigante had assaulted monsters in almost every corner of the continent, the Admiral had never been able to find where it actually nested. And then something changed. When Zora Magdaros had breached into the Everstream and opened up this passage, the Admiral had been able to track Nergigante through it. And so, the Admiral, the Handler, and the Sapphire Star stepped out of the rocky tunnel and into a battleground. Rocky spires and lava rivers accented this rugged mountain range, only broken up by bizarre, massive crystals erupting from the ground. This, the Admiral explained, was the Elder's Recess, the place he suspected Nergigante used as a base. Despite the fire and rock, the air in the recess was distinctly sweet, overpowering, and oddly alluring. But most crucially, the air positively vibrated with that familiar energy. Now, looking at this landscape, the role of the crystals, both big and small, became obvious. They were not full of bioenergy. They were bioenergy in solid form. The Admiral confirmed this suspicion. In the recess, bioenergy from the Everstream leaks out onto the surface, where it saturates the ground but also solidifies into crystals. Bioenergy was a valuable source of life and so, powerful monsters gathered here. Monsters such as Nergigante. The Admiral suggested that this might also explain the sudden appearance of powerful monsters and subspecies all across the continent. According to him, Zora Magdaros had likely perished at sea by this point. Its death would have sent an invisible but vast wave of energy across the land, riling up powerful creatures that usually elude the commission. Once agitated by this taste of bioenergy, these monsters might have sensed its abundance in the Elder's Recess through the passage that Zora Magdaros had opened. Their attempts to reach it and feed on these crystals might have been the reason for the unusual behaviors and migrations seen in the various ecosystems around the New World. Either way, the Elder's Recess would surely prove invaluable to understanding Nergigante and its place in the ecosystem. So, the Admiral sent out the star to investigate the environment and search for any clues regarding Nergigante. On these rocky slopes, the Sapphire Star witnessed many curious sights. 
fanged wyvern that exclusively eat rocks, massive flying wyvern whose body produces explosive scales. But they also found familiar creatures. Lavasioth and Uragan both made this place their home, closely resembling their old world cousins. And across the entire area, spikes left behind by Nergigante could be found. Once the star decided that they had collected a sufficient amount of samples, they decided to return to Astera. Upon their arrival, the town was in uproar. The changes to the environment were even more extreme than predicted. One hunter claimed to have spotted a Devil Joe in the ancient forest, a brutal and infamous brute wyvern feared all across the old world. But that had only been the beginning. Reports had started pouring in describing numerous Elder Dragon sightings all across the continent. While the presence of Elders besides Zora Magdaros on the continent was an accepted fact, all fleets had followed one after all, they had so far proven elusive and hard to track down. But now, suddenly, all kinds of Elder Dragons had begun appearing out in the open. Another oddity was the sudden surge of incidents involving the Gajalaka, a native tribe of Linians that were only rarely seen in the past. They suddenly began appearing near Astera. This indicated a serious, not to mention dangerous, disruption of the ecosystem, so the commander ordered all hunters to investigate these appearances. Tirelessly, the entire commission combed through the wilderness to observe and analyze anything that could be of note. Tracks were gathered, remnants of turf wars meticulously recorded, and, most crucially, the thorns left by Nergigante were investigated closely and rigorously. Eventually, the researchers of Astera came to a conclusion that would shake the entire guild. According to their findings, Nergigante was the natural predator of Elder Dragons. It hunted and ate them as prey. More specifically, it seemed to hunt just about anything, but preferred victims with a large amount of concentrated bioenergy. Thus, Nergigante targeted primarily Elder Dragons, and especially Zora Magdaros. A researcher of Linian culture and language managed to communicate with the jittery Gajalakas and gleaned another vital piece of information. Their tribe, which had lived in the New World for generations, had no historic myths or legends involving Nergigante. It was not a native species of the New World. Instead, it seemed that Nergigante traveled to the New World to intercept the Elder Crossing whenever it happened, hoping to exploit the phenomenon to hunt powerful Elder Dragons. So too had it attempted to feed on Zora Magdaros, only to be repelled by the Commission both times. But nature always found a way, and so, after Zora had perished at sea, Nergigante had followed the hum of bioenergy further north, into the continent and into the Elder's recess. There, it had begun terrorizing all local monsters, including other Elder Dragons and the Gajalaka. That was likely why Elder Dragons had suddenly begun appearing. They were trying to escape Nergigante's gluttony. But in this slurry of outrageous news lay the key piece to victory. When Nergigante had arrived in the Elder's Recess, it had chosen to make its nest there, likely delighted by the copious buffet of prey. And it had made that nest right next to the ancestral home of the Gajalaka tribe. They had, just like the Elder Dragons, escaped from the Recess and into the regions near Astera. So not only could the Gajalaka lead the commission to exactly where Nergigante was nesting, slaying the beast would hopefully both stabilize the ecosystem and go a long way in establishing friendly relations with the Gajalaka, who would be able to return home. So, the commander issued an urgent quest to slay Nergigante, and naturally, the Sapphire Star accepted. Journeying through the Elder's Recess 
was unnaturally quiet this time around. It was as if all life had been sucked out of the region, as all inhabitants had either fled or were hiding, terrified of the ravenous predator that had invaded their homeland. As the stars stood near the crystalline structure that led to the dragon's nest, they witnessed the last few Gajalaka escaping the area, driven off by the star's target. And there, past the smoke and rock, stood Nergigante, its spiked limbs tense with predatory hunger. To it, the entire world was a feast, and the star merely an appetizer. With a roar, it attacked, in celebration of what it thought would be an easy meal. But the Sapphire Star was no mere morsel. They fought back with all their might. The battle proved grueling. Every time the star wounded the beast, its skin regenerated and its spikes regrew. But also, Every time Nergigante regrew its spikes, the star would wound the beast anew. It was a brutal battle of attrition, two forces of nature locked into a struggle as tenacious as it was ferocious. But through the gnashing of teeth, broken spikes, bloodied horns and screaming muscles, through the heavy air of the recess, in the gentle light of the life-woven crystals, through all of that, there was only one outcome that could come to be. One result. Dust settling upon the corpse of Nergigante, sprawled out under the indomitable heel of the guild's sapphire star. The extinction dragon had been slain. Short-lived elation swept through Estera. It had become clear that the Sapphire Star was the kind of hunter that only existed once in a generation, a true master of the trade. That alone inspired confidence and joy in the Asterians. Unfortunately, the slaying of Nergigante did not quite have the desired effect. It appeared as if the displaced Elder Dragons had no plans of going back, as they continued to roam in the south of the continent. Moreover, their presence was further escalating the power balance of the environment, with increasingly stronger monsters appearing as time went on. It became obvious that someone had to simply go out and slay these Elder Dragons, if only to mitigate the damage they could cause. Naturally, this task fell onto the Sapphire Star. The commission was mostly made up of veterans, hunters who had faced Elder Dragons before, but none of them could compare to the star, the hunter who had guided the commission to success time and again. This time, they would have three targets. Kushala Daora, a wind dragon like the one the first fleet had followed into the new world. Its ability to create tornadoes was well known and feared in the old world. Tiostra, a fire dragon that had led the second fleet on their journey. Just being near it can burn one's skin. And finally, an entirely new Elder Dragon. Val Hazak, the Lord of the Rotten Vale, a grotesque creature that thrives among death and decay. It seemed to be able to control and weaponize the effluvium in the Vale. While its existence had long been rumored, it was only recently that it had actually emerged. Three fierce opponents, Three brutal battles. Three indisputable victories. In the face of the Sapphire Star, even ancient dragons stood no chance. But even in triumph, no one could quite relax. The Sapphire Star had done well at combating the symptoms of various ecological anomalies, but the Commission was no closer at understanding their root causes. The crucial questions still lingered. Why had the Elder Crossing increased in frequency? And why had Zora Magdaros changed its course and traveled past the Rotten Vale into the Everstream? As the Elder Dragon sightings died down, the time for answers had finally come. The Admiral once again appeared out of thin air, 
grabbing the Sapphire Star and telling them to pack their things. It was time. He and the Seeker had discovered what had been causing these anomalies. The Seeker had also asked the Admiral to relay a message to the Star. I will be waiting in that place beyond, where all things converge. The Admiral took the Star and the Handler deep underground, into a vestige of the Everstream that lay directly under the Elder's recess. Here, the tunnel held a glistening blue river, a stream of pure bioenergy in liquid form. And yet it was completely quiet. Nothing called this place home. As the light of pure life force danced on the cave ceiling, life itself was entirely absent. Here, they met the Seeker, who had prepared a boat for the journey through the stream. The discovery was further ahead in the tunnel. As they paddled through the Everstream, the Seeker slowly, carefully explained what he had found. It seemed as if he wanted to prepare the Sapphire for what lay ahead. The New World's Everstream was an ecological marvel, a self-sustaining energy recycling system that ensured ecological prosperity for an entire continent. Key to that was the regular Elder Crossing, where dying Elder Dragons were attracted to the Everstream's bountiful energy and came to the Rotten Vale to die. Their bioenergy seeped into the Earth after death and into the Everstream, spreading across the entire New World and rejuvenating the system. In the North, excess bioenergy leaked out of the stream and formed crystalline structures, which themselves helped attract and feed the continent's most powerful creatures. It was a closed loop that had worked without irregularity for millennia. But as of recently, something had been off. In theory, the base amount of energy stored in the Everstream at any given time should be roughly stable, spiking during the death of an Elder Dragon but falling back down to a baseline when the energy is spread and absorbed across the landmass. But the Seeker had noticed that the Everstream had been continuously storing more energy than before, its brimming rivers ever fuller with bioenergy. This was likely a consequence of the increased frequency of the Elder Crossing, and the New World's ecosystem wasn't able to disperse the energy fast enough. Instead, this surplus energy was traveling... somewhere. Traveling in the same direction that Zora Magdaros had pursued. Soon after, the Seeker had noticed something even more concerning. Bioenergy is naturally attractive to most creatures, its distinct hum a sign of life and prosperity. But overlaid over the signal was another sensation. A sweet smell that permeated the Everstream and the Elder's Recess, and that had spread even further after Zora's death. This alluring scent was not tied to bioenergy. It was a different signal calling monsters not to the Rotten Vale, but here, to this confluence of fates. They were close to the source of that scent, the anomaly that had derailed the Elder Crossing. All of them had a suspicion at that point, but none dared to speak it out loud. The Seeker simply summed it up with, something is terribly amiss. Finally, they reached a chamber where the flow of the Everstream ended. They left their boat behind and gazed at a terrible, magical scene. The entire ceiling was saturated with glowing crystals, some of absurd size. And in the middle of this constellation, a glowing sun, a radiant orb of pure energy, white-hot and luminous. Oh, how the team wished it were just a trick of the eye, or a splendid gem. But no. This was a cocoon. And it was wriggling. Something was about to be born. Light erupted from the sphere. Rays of blinding white searing through solid rock and shaking the cave like thunder. 
As the cocoon unfurled, the star's suspicions were confirmed. Bioenergy fuels life, and stronger creatures produce more of it in purer form. But what if a monster were to incubate right in the middle of the Everstream? And what if that parasite were to artificially amplify the rate at which energy flowed through its domain? For example, by releasing a sweet-smelling pheromone that attracted elder dragons to the new world more frequently than usual? Well, the creature in question would be able to feed on an unimaginable amount of raw bioenergy while also transforming the continent's ecosystem in the process. The three hunters, wise and experienced, all understood that that was what had happened. The thing that fell from the cocoon had manipulated nature to bathe in the energy of life itself. In the race for ecological supremacy, this being had found the perfect strategy to ascend beyond any known creature. As the glowing insides of the creature began to stir and its limbs stopped twitching, the Admiral and the Seeker immediately retreated. There was only one hunter who could rival whatever this was. Here, in the heart of the New World, the Sapphire Star versus the Light that Beckons Dragons. It was a fight unlike any other. It had barely left its cocoon, and yet the creature instantly recognized the star as a threat and threw itself at them. Its body was aflame with the light of life, beams of pure energy erupting from its mouth. It was so large that it initially struggled to fly, instead assaulting the star from the ground. Eventually, its wings unfolded properly, and with a roar, it took off. The cave that had birthed this abomination crumbled, and soon the battle had moved atop a giant crystal. It was all or nothing. A creature doused in this much energy would bring disaster wherever it traveled. Even now, mere moments after its emergence, its chest glowed ever brighter, the intensity of its white-hot power doubling, tripling, growing ever stronger. Very soon, it would grow to be an unstoppable force. But the Sapphire Star had already overcome so much. They had crossed the Dark Sea, fallen off a dragon, conquered entire food chains, stood before a walking mountain, slain that which preyed on living gods. What was one more impossible feat, one more legendary victory in the face of all that? One careful move at a time, the Sapphire Star dodged the beams and bites and swipes of the creature and each time retaliated tenfold. All the bioenergy in the world could not stand up to a monster hunter in their element. And so it was that, eventually, the creature became sluggish. Its body was still glowing, but its movements could not keep up. Not long after that, the final blow was struck. As the confluence of fates crumbled to dust under the sheer pressure of this fight, the Sapphire Star stood victorious, once and for all. The hero came to some time later, swaddled in a bed in Astera. Shortly after the fight, they had passed out and had to be recovered by their fellow hunters. Emerging from their quarters, the Sapphire Star was surrounded by cheers. Most of Astera had been anxiously waiting for them to wake up, and now, celebrations could start in earnest. The commander declared the Elder Crossing investigation as completed. All that was left was to party. It was a banquet, the likes of which only true hunters could organize. Dishes of all kinds covered every flat surface available, while the ale flowed aplenty. The star's handler could barely contain herself as her eyes darted across the scene. The star themselves, meanwhile, enjoyed a cool drink in the company of the Seeker and the Admiral. Together, the three pondered the sheer magnitude of what they had witnessed. 
a being that hijacked the natural balance to imbue itself with the power of life. Even for the guild standards, that was quite the tale. But the evening was cool, and so was the booze. There were no worries left, only the friendships forged in their flames. And so, the evening danced onwards, with all of Astera joyfully bidding their 40-year endeavor goodbye. As the evening drew to a close, the commander asked for everyone's attention. He had received a communication from the guild in the Old World. The creature they had fought had been classified as an elder dragon, named Zeno Jiva. Beyond that, the guild congratulated the commission on a job well done and officially relieved them all from duty. They could now pack up and return to the old world as soon as they were ready. But the guilt letter slyly remarked that maintaining Astera as a permanent satellite base even after the Elder Crossing mystery had been solved would hold untold potential for future research. It was up to the Asterians to choose if they would prefer to stay and continue their work or return to their lives on the old continent. The response was unanimous. No one wanted to leave. In unison, the commission decided to remain in the new world indefinitely, and none other roared their conviction as loudly as the Sapphire Star. In the new world, they had found a frontier of wonder and awe, and surely there would be many more adventures to be had. During the party alone, numerous leads on new discoveries had presented themselves. The huntsman claimed to have seen the tracks of a Lunastra. A researcher commented on the odd behaviors of a Legiana flock. And one hunter even boasted to have clues on the location of Kulf Taroth, the Elder Dragon of Gold that had been eluding the guild for decades. The wonders of this new world seemed endless. And so, everyone chose to stay, because they understood a fundamental truth. That in this vast world of monsters and hunters, the next adventure of a lifetime is just around the corner, waiting for a star to follow its call. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm so sorry this took so long to make. This was way harder than I expected. I got sick on two separate occasions during the production. So yeah, I, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really did put my all into this. Um, as always, a very special thank you to all of our patrons, including The Dollarfish, Yamiroth, Andre, Ryan Hook, Thick. Kuroneko, Zion H. V. Augenson, A. J. Rivera, Alistair, Jacob Bennett, Soruka, Gengreatest, Sir Nutnut, Terador, Emperor Evie, Rambling Robin, Lizric, Hashi, Black Ace 202, Dissi, Habo Himbro Mirror, Magenta Magenta, Danilo Villavicencio, Arcturian 711, Russell, Person 212, Claire Miboon, Oakwood Tree, Mr. Pyramid, Pide Fuego, Makot O2, Project Iceman, Peroscoco, Geo, Jamie Tate, Niels Schlatter, Fiction Ape, Iron Camel, and Nah, I'm going to bed. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.